one, two, three, four. Okay. Howdy, Howlers. It's Sako to me, also known as Cass Voight. I write horror, and I'm a witch, and a graphic designer, and sometimes I combine those three things to bring you content. Today, we are doing a horror panel on how to make your sto scary stories scarier. And with me today is the wonderful Sarah. And I would like very much if Sarah could introduce herself to the to the populace. Yeah, um, I am Sarah Schreinover. I typically write horror. Uh, once in a while I write other things, but they're always like dark. Um, and I like spooky stuff in general, so. Like, not just books, but like all the spooky stuff, so. All the spooky stuff. Mm -hmm. Me too. <clears throat> Talking about the weather. Oh, my chat was not open. Derp. Oh, the weather. All right. I have this glorious screen. Um, Chrome tab. Come on. Did that do what I wanted it to? It did! Hooray! Yay. So technically there is supposed to be a third person with us. However, um, she has gone MIA. It is not a problem. We will be here when she when she eventually comes. <clears throat> so who the fuck are we? I am a technically a World of Darkness fangirl. So my vampires, my werewolves, my other creature denizens of the dark. Um, I come from a school where they're supposed to be scary, and. I basically write fan fiction for White Wolf products. Um, they have like a little caveat in their legal stuff to where I can actually do that, which is awesome. <clears throat> do you write for like the, the guilds on uh, tabletop? Sometimes. Like, um, do you? Yeah, sometimes. My husband works for Onyx Path, so. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. I haven't touched um, fifth edition because they've they've got like a vice grip around anything fifth edition. So I'm kind of like, okay, I'll stay in 20th anniversary. It's fine. <laughs> it's fine. It'll be it'll be great. The boogeyman got Tawana. Absolutely. Yup. Um, da, 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 it's also da. possible, like time zones or day job or sleep. Um, all, of the, <laughs> all of those things are probably the, <laughs> right. the thing with with Tawana. Absolutely. That's and I will never hate on someone for getting their sleep. I will never, in my opinion, like sleep and like self care totally take precedent over anything. Anything else, like I'm better at sleeping than I am at anything else. <laughs> right on. Not I. I am sleeping. At <coughs> I'm an expert sleeper. Excellent. All right. Um, so the things that we're going to be talking about today, we're going to go over some subgenres. Uh, we'll talk about the elements that you can sprinkle into a horror story. We'll talk about some tropes that maybe you want to avoid. Uh, we'll also address pacing in a horror story, which is very different from pacing in a normal, uh, like fantasy or sci-fi sort of story. And then we'll go into recommendations for good horror that uh, we have watched, read, listened to, whatever. All right, so subgenres. So I went from small to large when it comes to horror. Um, we've got the three to five word, which is what it says on the tin, 
right? So you tell the scariest story you can in three words or five words, depending on the challenge. Creepypasta is short, it's basically a uh, internet lingo for copy paste um, and they are basically stories that have been passed around the internet as urban legends and of their own design. Pulp horror and penny dreadfuls. <clears throat> penny dreadfuls were uh, very popular in the early 1900s. Um, they were like little serials and they were quick and to the point. Um, let's see, less dread, more shocking horror. Wow, I, I really butchered this uh, text. It's fine, it's fine, <laughs> it's, it's fine. Uh, so gothic horror is the stuff at the turn of the century that uh, that's your castles and your sweet little vampires that have their darling woman that they're trying to seduce and uh, classic wolf man, classic mummy, that sort of thing. But also there within Gothic horror, there is like Southern Gothic, there's blue, Blick, blue book Gothic, there's urban Gothic. Uh, if you write like romance and you want to add a little bit of spooky, I would probably go the gothic route. Um, it takes to the language a lot easier. Then you get into survival horror, dark fantasy, body horror, grotesquerie. Um, if you are unfamiliar with, oh, I never changed the, oops. I never changed the description on that. Yeah, I, I rushed through this, I did. Uh, <laughs> uh, survival horror is literally just that. It is the protagonist's sheer goal is to survive through the story. Dark fantasy is what it says on the tin. It is high fantasy that is that has an overarching horror theme, body horror, terrible things that can happen to the body, grotesquerie, that's your HP Lovecraft, Mary Shelley, that sort of stuff. And also like, um, what is it called? Oh, there's that movie about the lady who gives birth to the baby and the baby's dead and she like wills it back to life and then the baby basically becomes like a zombie, essentially. I oh, I haven't seen that it. one, but. I'll, I'll remember no. the name of it during the stream, but um, I absolutely adore watching body horror, but I cannot write it, um, but it's the scariest thing in the world to me. Yeah. The um, scariest. Drag Me to Hell is the closest thing I think I have. To the Fly. Play. The Fly. Absolutely. Is a body horror. That's one of the modern classics. Um, what the hell is the name of it? I'll have to message my husband and ask him. Yeah, I gotcha. Midwest Gothic, absolutely. Which is that which scares the shit out of me. <laughs> Midwest Gothic super spooks me out. My mm -hmm. husband is terrified of cannibal rednecks. That's like his specific cannibal niche of fear. Mm -hmm. And like, if we're driving in like the sticks and the car starts acting funny, he's like, uh, no, no. <laughs> it's Grace. Grace is the name of the movie. Grace, gotcha. It's called Grace. It's very good. It really effed me up for like a long time. I'll have to look into it. It's very good. It's from like the mid 2010s. Nice. So it should also be easy to find. Yeah, very likely. So ways that you can kind of sprinkle horror in one, like we were just talking about tap into common fears, like people fear the unknown, right? They fear, fear that which they don't understand. So anything like that, like, we 
don't understand uh, redneck culture in a lot of ways. We don't understand cannibalism in a lot of ways. We don't understand phobias in the sense of water, fire, heights, claustrophobia, agoraphobia. I mean, the list goes on and on. Anxiety and depression is a common, common element something that people can attach to. Yeah, if you're gonna use a phobia, the the big problem you're gonna run into is you have to make any reader experience that phobia as well. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a character who's afraid of water, just establishing they're afraid of water doesn't work. You right. have to make the reader then afraid with them um, because every reader isn't going to be afraid of water. Right. So. That's one of the big things. If you're going to use like a phobia, especially something that's real specific like that, you want to make sure that you're building it up in the reader to be as scary as it would be to the to the protagonist. Yeah. Weird. Uh, Streamyard is giving me like weird, weird glitches. Um, you know, all of YouTube has been funny for like the last four or five days. Uh, yeah, I've noticed that. I, I have repeatedly been on streams where I thought nobody was talking and then I refreshed and they've been talking the whole time and it just wasn't tell, populating comments. Yeah. People talking to me and I'm just ignoring them like an ass. <laughs> I don't just ignore people. That's not a thing. Like I, and I'll tell you to go after yourself if I have to, but I'm not going to just ignore you. No, no, exactly. <laughs> like, that's not my deal. Uh, Devin is absolutely right. Slasher movies usually count as survival horror. The monster usually. attacks, right? And yeah. you have to survive the monster. Yeah. Especially the survival horror typically hinges on being separated from the general population. Mm -hmm. um, however, you know, you do get into those Jason Takes Manhattan, which is technically a slasher and probably on some level a survival, but it's it's a lot harder nowadays to do that in anything resembling a city because we have cell phones and we have the internet and we have, so you need to disable those outside connections, yeah, which, exactly. which also becomes really apparent that you've done that. Mm -hmm. So you have to be very careful doing that, especially if you do it regularly, like doing it. In, if you do it in one story, don't do it in the next story too, because then you're going to be known as that person who just disables the phone so that they don't have to deal with them. Right. <clears throat> Would paranormal activity slash Blair Witch sort of found footage movies are those, do, do those count as survival horror or are they their own, like found footage their own? I I mean, I think they, more their own trope. I think some of them would fall into it. I think I think we're we're talking about tropes that will intertwine because I think Blair Witch Project is a survival because they're in the woods, they can't just get back to civilization. But Paranormal Activity, they could just go to a different freaking house. Right. <laughs> so I don't feel like there's as much survival there because they they are making the choice to stay in this place when they could stay. I mean, they could put a tent in the damn yard. Like, yeah. like they could do something. So I think I think it kind of depends. It does. I'm not a huge found footage board. person. Yeah, yeah, I'm not either. But um, it has its place. There are some well, that did it better. Yeah, and part of the problem is is that I was I was just starting to become a serious writer at the time when found footage became a a big thing. Uh -huh. So I think it just was. It, it's like when you. Um, when you can't stand the one radio song from your favorite band, yeah, it's like that. Yeah, it's like I love them and I love the thing, but I can't do the thing anymore because I've had too much of it. Absolutely, I feel the same way. That and there's, uh, I have this thing where I watch the found footage videos or movies. And uh, all I can think the entire movie is get that man a steady cam. <laughs> That's all I can think. Yeah. Yeah, I um, I I'm not 
I've never been a huge found footage person. I did like Blair Witch, but like I said, I was like 16 or 17 when that came out. I was 17 because I could go in the theater and my little brother couldn't, um, which resulted in me and my friend leaving my brother and his girlfriend, who is now his wife. So I don't feel oh. that bad about it. Um, we just <laughs> left them outside of the theater. Oh. While we went and saw the movie. Because <laughs> they wouldn't let us bring them in. I got to stay, I got to camp in the woods where the Blair Witch was filmed. Oh yeah. It's like in like rural Maryland mm -hmm. sort of situation, but it's a camping ground. Yeah. <clears throat> um, Devin doesn't understand politicians. So maybe that's a horror thing that we can tap into. Well, and when you look at things like the dead zone, the dead zone zone is a politically based horror. Like yep. all of all of what you're afraid of in the dead zone is what this politician's going to do. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it does work, but you also then have to be well versed yourself in how politics works, and you also really have to enjoy it um, because. A lot of people, especially like in 2020, a lot of people are not looking to have fun with politics. It's not fun right now. Um, um, it's a little too real. Right, right. And that's the thing is like, because it's not fun right now, you're gonna have to do a lot to really play with that, to get that to sound fun to people. Mm -hmm. um, in 1985, which is roughly when the Dead Zone came out, it was not that way, you know, like politics was still ridiculous and you could still, you know, make fun of this politician and not then be attacking an entire group of people. <laughs> like it was, it was a much different climate. So yeah, yeah, it can, it can work, but I think in 2020, it's a little bit more iffy. Uh, American Horror Story tried. Yeah. You know what? I like cult. I, I'm I like giving it. it a shot. I'm giving it a shot. I, I like not watch the whole thing, but it's not my favorite. I actually um, put uh, Roanoke way higher on the list than anyone else does. So my opinions of horror. Are oh, okay. Incredibly different Roanoke. than everyone else. I watched like three episodes, but the documentary it's is like probably number three for me. Just kind of distanced myself. And from I, the I hate Coven. There, I said it. I like Kathy Bates. I like Angela Bassett. I like a lot of the things about Coven. I just think witches are dumb. Not like you, but I think, I think. Witches in. Witches. Uh, I also hate vampires. Uh, so I, I don't like, I don't like a uh, hotel either. Mm -hmm. I just don't. I got tired of a couple of different horror tropes and just gave up on them. And witches and vampires, are the two main ones, I just can't. Yeah, I got you. But I really enjoy Apocalypse, and Apocalypse is based on the witches. Like, so you have to have Coven. So that's why I don't like hate Coven because I'm because otherwise the context is well. And I'm really comfortable. Like one of the I, I'm really big on um, Stephen King miniseries. Those are one of my favorite things to, especially like if I'm writing because I've seen them all a hundred times. Right. So when I'm writing, I tend to play those. Um, and one of the big criticisms of Rose Red, which is one of my favorites is that the first episode, the first two hours, you don't even get to the house, to the building, right. the house. Right. And I love it. <laughs> <laughs> like, are we gonna talk about being spooked out for like two hours first? Sure, let's do it. Let's do it, I'm for it. If and I know- can, If they can keep it spoopy, right. like on your way there, then yeah. you, absolutely. And some people just, that's not the speed they wanna go at, and I get that. But for me, it's, I, I love it. I, I really like that slow build stuff. I like the slow build as well. But it can't be too long. <laughs> like, yeah, and it I have a threshold. <laughs> and it does depend on how you're building it. Like, um, I criticize Anne Rice a lot because I swear to you, I read 40 pages about Lestat's fucking buttons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I can't. I can't spend 40, 40 pages talking about Lestat's buttons on his coat. I don't care that much. Yeah, I don't care that much. I don't. So, like, we have to find a happy medium on the build. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Natalie. Good to see you. Um, Z Nation also has a bit of 
politician stuff in it. There's an episode that pokes fun at the current politics of the U.S. Um, that is true, uh, though <laughs> that is a different audience, right? So, like... I'm not familiar with Z Nation. I think... I think the rest of the world is looking at the U.S. and going like, welcome to the crowd. Oh, you have a dictator for your, for your uh, prime minister slash president? Okay. You know, like Italy and Russia and, the, you know, the rest of Europe are basically like, well, now you've joined the rest of the world. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that one. It's probably a zombie thing, isn't it? It is a zombie thing, yeah. I don't love zombies either. I just, I get really tired of tropes really fast. Um, Understandably. And the other problem is, is that I don't invest time to just watch things. Um, mm -hmm. I have a really hard time sitting down and just watching something. I feel guilty. I feel like I'm wasting my time. So... I tend to watch the same things over and over and over again because I can watch them and play Sims or watch them and write or watch them and play on my phone or whatever the case may, or chat or whatever. Sure. Um, I just, I, I have to be doing something or I feel like I'm being unproductive. So that's the problem with me watching newish things. So a lot because of the stuff I watch you have to fit in. I feel that way about foreign <laughs> horror. I love foreign horror. I love mm -hmm. it. Yeah, um, but if you have to read it, then you have to But I have focus. to read it. I have to be, like, lying in bed with my phone right here, like... Uh, I'm a David Lynch fan, anything so um, anything you're else. not supposed to watch a movie on your phone. I know. David Lynch is going to lose his mind. <laughs> he's, he's in L.A. right now going, what did someone say on YouTube? <laughs> what did someone say? Yeah. Um, Shelby says, I like Anne Rice, but it's true. <laughs> you can't contest it. Well, and I mean, I will, I make fun of Stephen King all the damn time. Like, oh, I'm, a, I'm a big Stephen King him. fan, but I will make fun of him. Because if you can't make fun of the people you love, then what's the point? Jace uh, has his strong opinion about, um, about a AHS cult and hotel and... I kind of concur. I mean, here's the thing is there isn't a season of American Horror Story that I will tell you is bad. But the, none of them are particularly good either. <laughs> but there are, I have issues with every single one of them. I have um, issues with every single one of them. Uh, Apocalypse, I think is, there is definitely a story there that is very captivating, but there's also a lot of fan service blowing your fans kind of shit mm -hmm. going on. And like, that's great in a Kevin Smith movie, but I don't love it so much in a horror series. Right. You know, like I don't mind going to a Kevin Smith movie and watching him just pay service to me for two hours. I don't mind that at all. Uh -huh. But I came here for comedy, so that's different. Mm -hmm. But it feels weird to me to spend an entire episode at season one's location and close up a bunch of stories and, and then also unclose them up. But that's a whole separate story. That's a that's a longer that's a longer spoiler thing, but yeah. Yeah. So in order to add some spoopiness to your story. First tap into those things that people fear, right? Second the atmosphere is really important, right? A setting where it would make people uncomfortable and the main character has to be uncomfortable and then the, you are looking through the main character usually. So you, the character has to know, the character has to feel and express that to the reader. Also, hi, Jace. <laughs> um, 
Sometimes I'll be reading Stephen King and there will be a line in there that makes me go, sir, what the hell is this? Yes, absolutely. Like, Savvy likes bringing up the boobily boobs. Um, I, I don't know what book that's from, but either I haven't read it or I don't remember that. Yeah. It, uh, every once in a while, it's... Um, well, he also writes drunk, right? So, well, did he doesn't do anything drunk anymore? <laughs> Not anymore. That's true. <laughs> that's, that's, <coughs> I think I think we might be threatening his marriage if we start saying he does things drunk now. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't think his wife would be down with that at all. No, probably not. But I will say, for the record, cocaine's a hell of a drug. Cocaine is a hell of a drug. <laughs> I will write all the things. That's, I think he'd agree with that as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the next thing would be to make the stakes obvious. What does the character have to lose? And what are they doing to prevent losing that thing? I need that as a reaction gif. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, want to like King more than I do, just way too much character building for too little plot. Unless he's writing, I like his short stories more than I like his book books for probably that reason. Um, cause I like the character development. That's what draws me in cause I am character driven, right? And then that character does you associate with that character, you commiserate with that character, and then the character does like crazy shit. And you have to be like, oh, I understand why he's doing that. Oh, wait, I have to like explore that in myself. Why do I understand that thing? So that's the kind of writing I like to do is I write from the perspective of the monster and then explain why they are thinking the way they are thinking. And if the reader can commiserate, and attach themselves to the character, then they have to explore something in themselves uh, and and question their own their own perspective. Yeah, I, I do prefer character to plot, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, I am my my non horror reading tends to be a lot more character based. Mm -hmm. Mine too. So that is, that is definitely my preference. Um, and I, I think some of that just comes from the fact that at one point in time, like I thought I was going to be a literary writer. Um, and then I realized that that doesn't work for me. Yeah. So, but literary writing tends to be more heavily character based. So you'll notice the last point is to consider POV, right? I will tell you for the record, I never do this because I will never write in first person. I can't even read it. You don't have to write in first person. No, but I'm saying like, I can't even read a first person. Like my point of view is always third. I cannot, I can't even read a first person book. Yes, the stand does the count stand as horror. The stand does count as horror. Absolutely. Yeah. In fact, CJ, my best friend, if you guys don't know, um, she's actually religious. I am an atheist, so that doesn't enter into it for me. But for her, the stand is incredibly heavy. Yeah. Like she's she's a Christian and there's a lot of Christian themes and tones in it. Yeah. And it is like, she has to read it in sips because it is incredibly heavy for her. So I think it it does depend on who you are. And I would say also in 2020, the stand is probably much scarier to a lot of people than it would have been in 1990. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now that, you know, wiping, wiping everyone out <laughs> yeah. is a distinct possibility for an illness. I think people are a little more like that could happen. Um, speaking of for foreign films, I feel like there's a big difference in vibe. So, with with uh, Ringu or um, the other one whose name I can't remember, uh, the Japanese versions essentially, 
they are for a very different audience and they have oh, a yeah. very different tale that they're telling. And there's a lot of information that is held from the viewer or the reader. And therefore they are left to their own devices to decide what is so scary about that story. Yeah. Whereas Americans have to be spoon fed. Yeah, and see, that's that's another thing that you have to decide is like, what kind of audience are you actually writing for? Because like, I am a David Lynch person. So yeah, sure. my opinion is you figure it out yourself or there's no answer, have at her. But yeah. there's tons yeah. of people who are not having that. That is not of interest to them. They're never going to want to do that. That is mm -hmm. not the work they're interested in doing for your art. And that's, that's a thing you have to be consciously aware of. There are people who, whichever way you go, who are just not going to be interested. So Jace likes the balance, right? It doesn't, like, there's not necessarily, like, more character uh, generation or uh, exploration versus plot. I I think that character development is plot, personally, mm -hmm. but yeah, I'm I'm I will spend a lot more time wandering around getting to know a character than I will wandering around trying to get to know a setting um, or to see a picture the way it's described or things like that. I'm much more invested in learning what makes a person tick. But that's how I am as a person too. Mm -hmm. Like when I first meet someone, the first things I'm trying to figure out is what makes them tick, whether or not I jive with them and how I can engage them without like turning them off or making them uncomfortable. Those are the things I want to learn first. And some of that's, I have a social work background. Um, I was a social worker for 15 years. Oh, wow. So, oh, yeah. so that explains a lot. Yeah. 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 So I'm definitely more focused on that stuff. And that probably does come from that background. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Jace is uh, into the grotesquerie, which is cool. I can totally, uh, totally subscribe to that as well. Um, so with POV, um, I recommend closing in and from time to time, you can use the unreliable narrator. Yeah. Because you only know as much as the narrator, right? So the narrator, it, this works for mystery as well. There's, there's always a mystery element to horror, right? That's what makes it so spoopy. So if we close it in and make the scope real small, there's a lot that we don't see. There's a lot that we don't understand. And there, there's a lot we fear. So I like to use third person closed to, to be like, we are viewing it from inside this person's head. However, comma, it's not from their perspective. We are just watching him or her. All right. Uh, da, 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 da. Now we get into tropes. I only listed a couple, but there are yeah. hundreds. Yeah, for sure. Hundreds. So the three that stick out the most to me uh, in the kind of horror that I watch is the abandoned hospital, be it a psychiatric hospital from the like 20s to 40s, which were um, terrible in the US. And then also um, the TV wards, anything where people are abused yeah. or where people are have a high death rate. Those right. are really good. TV wards have incredibly high death rates, although the abuse levels are lower. But mm -hmm. a psych facility is going to have higher abuse levels and lower death rates. Right. So, but you do need to know what you're working with. Um, and if you don't want 500,000 ghosts, you might want to go with a psych unit where somebody, where some people might have died, mm -hmm. but you don't have to deal with 500,000 ghosts. 
<laughs> so that is something you need to take into account is like how much, how much supernatural am I going with or how little um, to, to try to get a feel for that. And mm -hmm. you can also go the route of just a normal hospital um, and, and manage it that way. But you also have to then keep in mind that you're also managing a hospital sized building. And that then also becomes a thing. That which I, is definitely a thing. Yeah. The story I'm working on right now takes place in a building, um, boys, takes place in a building that was a hospital, well, a psych hospital and a school. So it's a large-ish building. Mm -hmm. um, and that's one of the things that I've had to go back and try to make sure that I'm covering clearly is like how the building is laid out and how big the building is and how much ground they've covered. And, Having a floor plan helps a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And I know a lot of people do that with like Sims or things like that. If you guys don't already have yeah. some way to do it, um, video games that let you build a place, those are really useful. Even if it's not specifically Sims, there are several different video games you can do that with, but yeah. um, that can be a lot of fun, especially if you're trying to like figure out how long it would take to walk from one place to the other, you know, and you can kind of look at it. And it, it helps to do that. Forest horror. Um, there was this, so I watch a lot of LPs for horror, right? And there was this 24 hour challenge, like horror challenge where they had to, they had basically like 24 hours to create a game that, um, that was scary as fuck. And the most successful of them was like a, a forest cult sort of situation. And it was, uh, I would have to say it was really successful. Forests are not my favorite, especially at night. Night forests, not, not my favorite. TB wards leave scars and transcend even the building's life, yeah. Mm -hmm. Before the middle school I went to was built into a proper TB sanitarium, I still have nightmares about the damn place, yeah. I gotcha. Yeah, that's the, that's the most recent but old kind of like mass death that we have, especially mm -hmm. in America. Yeah was um, TV, yeah. yeah and, and a lot of that was like the sena sanatorium, sanitarium, whatever you want to call sanatorium. it. Sanatorium. Yeah, were, were lumped in, right? And even today, uh, it's often used as a spooky, like psych wards are used as a spooky thing, partly because it's never just the patients. It's never just like people who tried to kill themselves or whatever, it's also, uh, people who are detoxing from meth, from alcohol, from drugs in general, and then being on prescription drugs to replace those things. So there's a lot, a lot well, to unpack, a lot to... And, and there's also the constant question of, is a hallucination a hallucination, or is that something that I'm just not tuned into? I mean, you can play with that a lot. Yeah. Um, but the problem with playing with that is that you have to make sure you are being respectful of psychosis yeah. um, and not minimizing someone based on their psychosis or you're going to alienate a whole lot of people. Um, there are a lot of movies ha that have totally done that. And absolutely, I it really gets my goat. Super gets my That's, goat. Yeah, because I, I worked in psych when I was a social worker, and there have been movies that I've started off where 20 minutes into it, they've ex explained psych, and yeah. I'm like, nope, I'm done. Nope. 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 Done. <laughs> I will not finish you. This is terrible. I'm offended. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot of uh, that revolve around mental illness that I can't, because I understand it from a, you know, from a very specific perspective mm -hmm. and they alienate a lot of people because I am not a, a unique snowflake, right? Yeah. When it comes to to a lot of mental health issues. I'm, I'm just very against misinformation. That's so true. when they start doing things like 
um, people who have bipolar disorder are all hallucinating. That's not fucking true. It's no. just not true. It, it, can they? Yes. Are they? No. Like, when they start doing stuff like that, I'm like, you're doing a disservice to an entire community, and I can't abide that. So, like, and, and the thing is, is, like, if you have a bipolar person who is hallucinating, that's fine. That mm -hmm. happens. But when you start to make overarching statements about people based on their mental illness, then I'm out. Or if you just can't bother to research, so you like put someone on an antidepressant and say it's an antipsychotic, use Google. Use Google. Use it. Those studies are your friend. <laughs> right. Like, do not, do not just make shit up. Go and use the damn Google machine. So if Alexis is still here, I don't know if she is. But um, the apocalyptic log, right? That is. Super popular trope, especially now. Holy crap, the quarantine content yeah. that is coming out, like super, super apocalyptic. Yeah, um, I don't enjoy epistolary, so this is not my bag at mm -hmm. all. It's not my thing. No worries. I, and you know, the thing is, is that I am really specific about the horror I enjoy. Um, and even if I say, like, I don't like epistolary, I'm sure there are things that I would like. Um, but as a general rule, I don't enjoy them. And if I don't enjoy them enough to read them in a large amount, then I don't enjoy them enough to write them. Yeah, sure. So, and, and it makes no sense for you to write something if you're <laughs> lukewarm on it. Yeah, 12 years in a pharmacy makes... Um, yep. base cringe whenever people use the wrong meds for things in stories and shows. Absolutely. Absolutely. Freaking kills me. I know only about the building's history because I kept having the same nightmare. Some cosmic horror is trying to kill me and I'm trying to escape. But when I go to leave, I'm too afraid to. <laughs> no, yeah. no, it doesn't do that. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> Like, oh man, it kills me. Cause I worked in a nursing home. It was a psych facility, but it was a nursing facility. Mm -hmm. um, so I had a lot of experience with meds and stuff. And every once in a while, they'll just pull something out of their ass. And you're like, why did you decide to do that? Especially when you're like, I literally can tell you four other meds that actually do the thing that you just said. Mm -hmm. And I don't even have to look it up. So I know you could have Googled this. <laughs> like, Exactly. Do better. Do better. All right. So pacing and the ways that it is generally different. Usually you start with the mundane, but something is not right. Something is just a little bit, there's some kind of catalyst to, to launch you into like the creepy dumb, but you have to have like what normal is and how different normal is going to be at the end of the story. Nodding so hard that I can name four other drugs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. it's ridiculous. That's my husband used to make horror movies back when we first got married. And Aww. I would, I would be like, don't do that. Don't, don't do that thing. Yeah. Don't don't do that. That. <laughs> yeah. He's like, okay. <laughs> like, no, no, no. Appreciate, much appreciated. Yeah. Look, nope, you're going to look like an asshole. Don't do it. So the cool thing about this uh, beginning is like the peaks and valleys, right? So you can do the winding road that kind of like, ideally you would be filling dread. And by making your sentences longer, um, you can kind of like... Uh, just build your your scary time and then like have little spikes every once in a while just to kind of make things make things interesting. Yeah, I actually don't like constant build. I prefer um, for there to be drop offs. Mm -hmm. um, I really enjoy a good um, comic scene in the middle of a horror. Um, I like that cool off period to be able to think, oh, things are okay now. And then all of a sudden they're not. 
And then um, all of a sudden they're not. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I do find that the, the like comedy is incredibly useful in horror. Um, and I know that that's like the opposite, but um, comedy and horror actually, their pacing is very similar. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's also why you'll see a lot of comedians start in horror movies because the pacing is similar and it's easier to, to kind of slide into horror because you have that ebb and flow. Whereas like a rom-com tends to go at a constant pace. It tends to be much more of a flow. Um, horror and comedy both have to have spikes uh, right. of action. Right, exactly. So as said, if you want to draw it out and fill dread and use longer sentences. If you want to make things quick and urgent and alarming, then you use shorter and shorter sentences. So here we talk about like the stuff that we do like, stuff that was a good example of, of horror. Now, this is subjective, of course. Absolutely. Um, some people really love the B-movie stuff, which is more comedy than horror. Comedy in the middle. Comedy is like salt and pepper. <laughs> Every, add everything to taste. Absolutely. Comedy in the middle of a fight scene or a battle is good tool to add pace. Absolutely. And... The thing is, is that human beings, especially in the middle of stressful periods of their lives, which mm -hmm. a lot of us are in, um, need to be able to cool down the stress to be able to feel the stress again. Yep. Um, so, you know, a lot of times you don't notice how stressed you were until you start your vacation. <laughs> And then, and then you're like, oh, crap, I really needed this freaking vacation. But or, you need the same thing in your horror. Yeah. 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 And that you need to do the same thing in your horror so that all of a sudden one day you're like, oh, I really did need to cool off there. And mm -hmm. that was, I needed that tension to come down a little bit so that I could rebuild it. And also when you're doing that, then they expect the next beat to be a comedy beat. And when it's not, that catches them off guard. And that's when you can use your horror. And that's when you can really like stick that horror in there and, and kind of hit somebody with it. Absolutely. So I'm trying to think of like my top three, probably high tension. I'm a big fan. Uh, it essentially is a woman who is, it's a French movie for one, um, which means the audience is different. Um, woman is escaping a serial killer in a house in the middle of goddamn nowhere <clears throat> only to, and there's of course a twist. There is often a twist at the end, uh, of horror, uh, pretty much across the board. <clears throat> we need to furlough the politicians so they know how the rest of us feel. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's the whole thing with like political horror is that there's this huge disconnect from reality mm -hmm. and we just don't understand how they can be so isolated. Yeah. So the movie you were talking about, what movie is that? High Tension. High Tension is a French flick. Who directed that? It has a wonderful twist at the end that I'm a super fan of. Um, Fallen with Denzel Washington. That's pretty good, yeah. Is one of my favorites. Uh, that again has the twist at the end. Um, I like a twist at the end. Is, to twist or not to twist, right? But I like the twist. The twist is. I I almost always feel cheated by a twist. Hmm. It depends on the twist. That's yeah. true. 
I tend to feel cheated by them. It depends on the twist. Absolutely. They can leave you feeling like, but the twist doesn't make sense. <laughs> when the twist doesn't make sense, it seems like a cop out. Right. I'm out of coffee and I disapprove of this. I'm out too. There's a twist and then there's a flip. Well, not necessarily a flip. The, that reminds of the fact that humans have a natural reaction to sometimes laugh in tense situations. Yeah. Oh yeah. For me, a hundred percent sure. Um, I actually, I'm terrified of needles. And one of the times when I had to get my blood drawn, um, the lady couldn't figure out why I wouldn't stop laughing. Like, and I just kept laughing. And she's like, what is wrong with her? And I don't remember if it was CJ with me or a different friend. It was when I was in college. Um, but the lady was like, is she okay? And they were like, no, she's not okay. Just take her damn blood. <laughs> just, yeah. She's real upset right now. Just take her blood and let her go laugh her way to her dorm room again. Yeah. It says twists are more often cheap. Cheaper than flips? Is that what you mean? I think that's what she's going for. Because yeah. I'm not necessarily, I don't necessarily mean that it has to be a 180. Like that's, that's not what I'm implying, but um, I just need like a little, just a little bit of a, of a, of a dive off so that it's makes sense in the context of the story but it's not something that I would have come to on my own. Uh, my husband is going to use a blender and I will be muting myself for that. Better choice is to throw in a new layer at the end that makes you feel the need to rewatch it for all the information. Um, That's definitely much more my wheelhouse. Like I said, I'm a David Lynch person. I really enjoy when the last five minutes of the, of the thing I go, oh crap. Now I need to rethink everything that happened up till now. Um, but I don't like when I feel like I was kept in the dark on purpose just to manipulate right. me. Right. And I think that's my problem with twists is that twists feel like emotional manipulation too often. Like that spoon feeding that we were talking about earlier. Yeah. Right. And that's, that's part of it is that, I mean, American cinema, um, especially like mainstream cinema, if you start to look more at non, um, studio release horror, you get a lot less of that kind of poisonous version of the twist. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Most of my favorites are not American. Or, or even, you know, like, like Kevin Smith level, I suppose is the best way to put it. Like side, you know, not really working for a studio. Maybe they have money so that they can do things but like, not like they don't have coming from Paramount. They're basically coming in and right. saying, hey, can and you make this more palatable for the average bear? Right, right, right. Somebody who basically kept kept the rights to their story rather than letting the producers decide what they were going to do with their story. Those tend to be better. Um, and as David Lynch says, always keep your final cut. <sighs> so, yeah. But I think, I, I think the, the big key for me, as far as horror goes, is that you have to, you have to be doing right by your audience. You can't lead them off to the left and then drag them to the right at the very end. Um, I have not seen us. I also have not seen us, but I, know I, I hear good things. Yeah, but I have not seen it. 
I haven't seen either of his movie of his horror movies actually because um so, like I said earlier, I don't get to watch stuff because I feel like I'm not being productive enough. The Jordan Peele stuff is good. It is, but there is I believe it. I just haven't seen it. It's there is an overtone of racism that you end up like addressing and if racism spooks you out, right? Then, then absolutely, then uh, you know for sure. But I feel like us is a different breed of horror, and from what I'm understanding, it's the the doppelganger, right? The closer you look at mainstream movies of any kind, the faster it falls apart. Yeah. And I think that's part of the reason that American Horror Story continues to do well, um, mm -hmm. is that it is not beholden to the production rules. And I think that's because they trust Ryan Murphy at FX. And they, they just go, all right, Ryan, do what you gotta do. Right, like, we got you, Ryan. You, he And he, I mean, Financially, he has not led them astray. <laughs> so so far, they're, yeah. they're making the right choice for their pocketbooks, which is what they're supposed to do. But mm -hmm. I think it is a lot harder for a film producer to take their hands off of a film than it is for a television producer. And I don't know why that is, but it seems to be. It's a different culture. It is. It is very different. Absolutely. But that's I, I don't understand artistically why that's so much harder for a film producer. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Either. I, maybe because there's more money involved. But it's a shorter term investment. It is a shorter term investment. So, I don't know. It's just very strange. But there I mean, more payout for a much more finite amount of yeah. time. I also think, um, and this comes from my bias against Hollywood, but... Um, Hollywood has an easier time not paying out on a film than on a show. Mm -hmm. Films will look like they are in the red for much longer than a show will. And if they look like they're in the red, then the investors are still making bank and the people in the movies are not, especially in smaller productions. Right. Um, so it's easier to manipulate your money. There's a reason my husband doesn't make films anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I got opinions. All the opinions. Yes. So it's the top of the hour. Uh, I thought that we would roll for two hours, but it looks like we're wrapping up right about now. Is there anything we, else we want to mention before we close out? See, and Natalie, like, enjoys Rosemary's Baby, and I don't like Rosemary's Baby at all. I actually don't like The Exorcist either, which apparently is. I follow them. That's, uh, here's the problem, though. I'm an atheist, and I've been an atheist for most of my life. So, religiously the religious based... Horror doesn't really... It, do yeah, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't hit anything for me. I'm yeah. afraid of almost everything, but religiously based horror does not really do much for me. So Yeah, I gotcha. And my parents aren't religious. Like when I wasn't an atheist, I wasn't religious either. So it's never been a serious enough part of me that it has hit that chord for me. Right. Hello, Orla. We're just wrapping up. There's a topic that hasn't really been touched on. And that's the tendency to cross horror with sexuality. Um, so because adrenaline and uh, certain pheromones are released at the same time, uh, stress often induces horniness, for lack of a better word. The scariest book uh, Raven has ever read was Stephen King's Revival. That's one of my least favorite Stephen King books. Really? Mm -hmm. It just did not... Every religious person I know says it scared the shit out of them. 
it did nothing for me. I was bored out of my mind. <laughs> so it has to be, it has to be my background. That has to be it. Yeah. But I'm terrified of the freaking dark. So I mean, there's that. What's your favorite horror tropes? I don't, I'm so bad at tropes. Like I don't really think in tropes. Um, I, every time somebody says a trope, I'm like, oh, that's a trope, huh? Yeah. yeah. I'm really like, I'm really bad at that kind of stuff. That's just not my thing. I, I really enjoy um, haunted places. I like that. Uh, whether it be a house or an asylum or whatever, I do like haunted places. I don't like the, um, I don't like the over hinging on saving ghosts, like the others, that kind mm -hmm. of thing, that whole yeah. like, we have to fix it for the ghosts. And I get why that has to happen to some extent, but I don't enjoy where I spend a half a movie being scared and then the second half of the movie trying to help these ghosts that I was scared of an hour ago. Mm -hmm. Like, why am I helping them? They're supposed to be scary. Right. Be friends now. And to be fair, I probably am doing that in boys and I probably should go back. And <laughs> now that I'm thinking about it. So Raven claims to not be religious uh, or Christian, as the case may be. So don't understand why Christians are scared by by revival. Um, it was really, it was the one that Jace was really hitting on when he was talking about building for ninety five percent and then only, and then putzing out at the last five percent plot. Well, I don't disagree about that book then, Jace. <laughs> I, take, I take my disagreement earlier back because I feel the same way about that book. Yeah. The prospect of there being an afterlife and it's universally just being absorbed by the eldritch horror. No escape, no other afterlife as an option. That fucked with me. <laughs> well, you know, the... the Sometimes the, it's that afterlife sort of fear, right? That, that thing that we don't understand, that thing that we don't know. And the idea that there is nothing we can do to avoid our fate. That there's no such thing as karma. There's no such, like you end up in a box and, and that's that, like that scares some people. Yeah, that's, I'm not afraid of death in any way. I am afraid of dying. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid of the act of no longer being alive, like the feelings that are associated there. But as far as I'm concerned, death is just a stop. That mm -hmm. doesn't scare me at all. I didn't exist before either. Sure. So that doesn't, that doesn't hit me. Oh, I have problems with Lovecraft, but I won't go into that here. So he, yes, this is a situation where we have to part him, part the artist from the work, right? And for those who are into the cosmic horror, into eldritch horror, um, you, uh, I, I like Hitchcock. I like Rear Window like the idea yeah, of seeing yeah. some terrible stuff and then not knowing what to do with it and knowing that they know that I'm the only one who possibly knows about it. What are mm -hmm. they going, oh, no, no. <laughs> but I'm an anxious person, so that kind of thing is like exactly how I feel. Sure. That works really well for me. The fear of not knowing what happens when you're in the process of dying and the possible panic, if there's panic, and what gets... That's what gets me. And that's the thing that gets me too, Shelby, is the whole, it may be an entirely different experience. Like, I think I have an expectation, and that whole damn thing could be a lie. <laughs> I have had several near-death experiences. One was rather recent. And because, like, I had COVID at the end of May, beginning of June, and it almost killed me. So, like, oh, wow. yeah, I had a six-hour like could not breathe attack. I could not move. I could not function. It was, it was bad. 
We are currently talking fear, absolutely. Hi, Dana, so good to see you. Hello, Dana friend. Hi, Sarah, so good to see you too. Hello, Sarah, and RK, who I don't think we said hi to, but hello, RK. Did we not say hi, hi to RK? I hi, think RK, RK just got here. We are, we are indeed talking fear. Yes, and you know, fear is funny because I'm like, Fear doesn't work always as just like a yes or a no. Um, I'm not afraid of snakes at all. Me either. But a, but a garter snake gets in my house and I have a panic. Oh. It's, it's, not, it's not the snake that I'm afraid of. It's the situation. It's a combination of I don't know what that snake's been through and my cats might bite it. And what if I go to pick it up and the cat tries to grab it out of my hand and then we have snake guts everywhere in my house and it's disgusting. And so like, those are the things that panic me about it. It's not that I'm afraid of snakes, but I'm afraid when there's a snake in my house, <laughs> I'm not afraid of mice. I don't want them in my house. I don't mm -hmm. like them, but I'm not afraid. So mm -hmm. like there is, there is something to be said for that. And discomfort is very useful in horror, even if it's not fear, you know, even something as simple as, um, I have an uncomfortable wedgie right now and there's a horror thing happening. Well, that discomfort adds to the horror thing, even though it's just like a wedgie and it's silly and it's whatever, it does add to it. There's a scene at the beginning of The Regulators. Um, I'm a huge Desperation fan, Regulators and Luke Mormon, but that's a whole separate issue. But there's a scene at the beginning of The Regulators where they're setting up what's happening and she's driving down the road and um, she is having some discomfort based on it being immediately after a sexual experience and that discomfort freaks me out. Like oh. it makes that scene so much weirder and so much uncom more uncomfortable for me that like, I'm trying not to be explicit about it, but it's, <laughs> it makes me uncomfortable on top of the, the building fear of horror stuff. So. So. People uh, seem to be struggling a little bit with separating the artist from the art because because yeah. he was a man of his time, right? So, like, he's a racist, sexist piece of shit. He is. However, that that was like part of the norm. But he was yeah. also ju mm. just off kilter enough to where he could write stuff like this. Was naming your cat the N word? Was that part of their time? I don't think so. I think he was just especially bad. Uh, yeah, maybe. Mm. But that's not even my main problem with Lovecraft. My main problem with Lovecraft is the it was a horror that was so horrible that I couldn't describe it because your human mind couldn't come up with the things that I saw, and it's the so terrible that you can't think of it. Then why are you telling me the fucking story? You yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's that's what. Um, that's the one thing that keeps me from reading Lovecraft derivative works is because there's a lot of there's a lot of that. Yeah, I just what like, was the most horrible thing? Well, what was the horrible thing? Ugh, I couldn't even describe it. How horrible it was. Yeah, then why are you? How are you a writer if you're not going to describe the horror? <laughs> but that's aversion as opposed to fear. Now, fear and aversion can be related, but they're not mutually exclusive. Absolutely. So, but yeah, I don't, the, the racism and stuff from Lovecraft, I am able to separate, but I also am not. But there's like, I'm all the more critical of the work. Yeah. And, and when you know those things are there, the work does tell you that those things are there. Like once you start really paying attention, you're like, oh, ew, why'd you say that? Gross. Yeah. So I try. Um, same with Crowley and witchy things for me. Crowley what? My cat's name Alistair, is Crowley. Alistair Crowley, yeah. Oh, Alistair Crowley. Okay, yeah. I mean, my cat sort of is named after Alistair Crowley. <sighs> He's named after the Ozzy song, which is about Alistair Crowley, so. <laughs> the sideways. <laughs> Chase is like, no, that's just me. <laughs> that's just how I describe things now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's, but like that, that's, 
that was one of the things that bothered me when I first got introduced to Lovecraft, um, like at the end of high school and beginning of college. So I was just like, is he going to tell me what the hell I'm supposed to be looking at? And like, all I know is there's tentacles. I don't freaking know. You know, there's plenty of tentacles in Japanese porn too. So if I really wanted to just like go have a good time with some tentacles, I don't need Mr. Lovecraft. If, if, if tentacles scare you, that's... Some people. That's some people. Yeah, that's, see, and that, I try so hard. Try so damn hard. Mm -hmm. I and, and I have a respect for the fact that Lovecraft basically birthed what I do. I'm not stupid. I'm not going to pretend that that doesn't exist. But I also think it's important to look at the people whose backs you're standing on and see why you're standing on their back and what things you're not bringing with you. Right. I think it's just as important to decide what you're not going to bring as it is what you are. Also, Shelby likes my cat's song. Um, mm -hmm. He used to come when I played it, but he doesn't anymore. <laughs> and I don't think he can hear it anymore. Yeah. But yeah. no man. No man. Nice That's I got. Yeah, I've got my Mr. Crowley and I've got my Dreamer. And then the kitten's named after the demon queen of fungi and rot from D&D. So her name is Love Tamoy. So, Super fun. That's, I didn't get to name her. <laughs> <laughs> that was hubby. I gotcha. I voted on it, but. It's a matter of shunning the past. It's not a yeah. matter of shunning the past. It's a matter of understanding and acknowledging it. Right, right. And we're building on these people. Like, to pretend that, that the horror genre would be what it is without Lovecraft is ignorant. Mm -hmm. um, but you also don't have to let yourself fall into those things. And you don't have to buy into everything that Lovecraft bought into. Yes, hello. I think Lovecraft's work comes through best in stories where he didn't have to describe the hor actual horror. Absolutely. Rather than its effects like The Color of Space, Dunwich Horror, for instance. Um, that it's about never meeting the monster until yeah. the very end. Uh, uh, well, even at the very end, you never actually see the monster. Yeah. Um, and I don't, I don't, that's just not my thing. Um, and there's, I mean, there's horror movies that are that way too, that yeah, like, sure. you don't ever really get it. And, and that's great. And I love that other people like that. It's just not my thing. Impact on the collective creative conscious is profound, but that's why I'm so reluctant to separate the art from the racist. It needs to acknowledge, to be acknowledged and talked about so it can be put to bed. Um, sure. Sure. Um, I think this is a situation where cosmic horror isn't just Lovecraftian, isn't just right. eldritch, like uh, Event Horizon, for instance, right? Which scares the bejesus out of a lot of people. It doesn't scare the. I've not seen it. It's all right. That's what I, I, I have a lot of people tell me it's really good, and then a lot of people tell me it's fine. It's fine. I've never heard it's bad. It's not bad. It's actually yeah. quite good. But but it seems like it kind of, it probably would be something that I'd be like, yeah, it's fine. Yeah, it's fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's why I haven't done it. I mean, it's it's really old. I, if I really wanted to see it, I would have seen it. Sci-fi horror was kind of like claimed by um, the Alien series, right? And the first one was the best because we only ever saw the a actual alien. See, and I like two. I don't like one. You don't like one. Well, two was good too. I like two way better. I like aliens better than alien. Mm. That's that. I mean, if you want to stick some, some, uh, What's his name? The artist who created those aliens. I can't Geiger, his name yeah. Right. Geiger. Yeah, some, yeah, you want to throw some Geiger stuff in anything, and I'm there. Like, I'm not going to argue his with His aesthetic <laughs> is, is super really profound. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm not, I'm not a visual art person. Like, I don't get it, really. 
Um, but I get him and I can, I think it's him. I don't know. Yeah, that. It's him. Yeah. Um, okay. But, and, and I can ID it from across the damn room. I'm like, Oh, there's some guy. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, that's, it's definitely something I can, I can ID. Um, so Raven blames Sam Neill for, Oh, event horizon. Um, I, I think if you can blame Sam Neill for something, you should blame Sam Neill for it. <laughs> Sorry, I have feelings. Sam Neill's kind of he's kind of a doofus. <laughs> but I, I love me some Jurassic Park, so I can't hate on him too much. That's and, and that's one of the things, like I I'm scared of huge stuff, like huge things scare the piss out of me. So like dinosaur movies scare the shit out of me. I'm this is, oh God, this is embarrassing. I can't believe I'm going to tell you guys this. I'm terrified of Night at the Museum. Terrified. Interesting. I am scared of museums. My bachelorette party was at the Natural History Museum in Chicago because I'm terrified. Terrified of big things. So like a, a dire bear or a, a Tyrannosaurus Rex's skeleton. Oh, mm -mm. Mm -mm. Mm. no, no, no. Everybody thinks yeah, the Night at the Museum is so cute. And scares the, shit is, the more scooped out by it I am. Because yeah, I, I, I spent my younger years in Arizona where the scorpions, like the big ones, like they weren't as poisonous. They weren't as aggressive. It's the mm -hmm. little ones you had to watch out for. Yeah. Right. That's, that's how spiders are too. And I mean, that's where all the aggression is. That Those are the ones that like to crawl into your boot and, and go to sleep. They're Napoleon spider or Napoleon uh, scorpions. They're like, I'm little, so I got to pack a punch. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. But like the ads for the Meg, which I have not seen, but like scare the crap out of me. That whole like something under the water and it's huge and it could come up under you or videos of people on a little boat. Like, and most of these are fun, but they're not fun to me. Those like people on a boat and there's like a blue whale coming up next to them. Ugh, that is no, no. Fun to me. <laughs> That's yeah. so scary. I can handle being in a boat. Yeah, I'm not afraid of water particularly. I am terrified of water. Water, yeah. me and water do not get along. My so, is afraid of water. But ocean water doesn't spook me out as much because I'm more buoyant in in water. That's with true. It, right? So I had a traumatic incident that induced my fear of water. Yeah, my, my husband, um, I believe he watched his friend drown. Yeah, he don't do water. Oh, sure. So it's always going to taint the content. Right, if you know who it's coming from and Absolutely. where it's coming, that's one of the problems people are having with um, J.K. Rowling right now. Yeah, absolutely, is, is that they're having a hard time because they love this thing that came from her, and then all of a sudden, they have to look at it through a different lens, and that is really hard, especially when you've already built that. Like. We're lucky that we can start reading Lovecraft knowing who Lovecraft was. Right. Um, but there's these people who fell in love with the Harry Potter series, and now they have to reconcile who J.K. Rowling is with that. And that's an entirely different thing. I think it's also, like, context, right? Yeah. So if we're reading horrible content, we're expecting the person to, who wrote that stuff to also be horrible. At least on some level, yeah. At least on some level. Um, with J.K. Rowling, like, let's take this whimsical, beautiful thing and then make the person who wrote it, like, be a horrible POS, right? Sage said she has, uh, or they have a... Uh, thalassophobia. I think that's the fear of big things or is that the fear of what's under the water? I can't remember which one it is. I can't, I don't know. Um, I'm not afraid of specifically what's under the water. I am creeped out to no end by like footage of the Titanic wreckage, things like that creep me out. And mm -hmm. the idea of like something coming up from under me, but just being in the water doesn't do that unless there's something there that I know of. Oh, I follow. That makes sense. Um, what's funny is that I'm not necessarily afraid of the things that are in the water. It's the, 
the feeling of drowning is the mind might be willing, but the body will fight. Like, yeah, <laughs> I, I had to buy a special tool when I got my PT cruiser because it had electric windows uh -huh. and I have a fear of accidentally driving into water and not being able to get out of my car. Oh. So I had to buy a tool that puts an electric jolt through the glass on a car and shatters the window. Right. Um, and like, since I now have a car that has crank windows and that makes me feel so much better because the pressure, if I hit the water, the pressure won't stop me from being able to roll down my window <laughs> so that I can swim out. Yeah, sure. Because being stuck in my car and drowning is way scarier to me than drowning. That's, I don't that's, think I'm going to wipe out, if I haven't wiped out my car into the estuary before, I'm probably not going to do it in the future either. So, um, Probably going to be fine. I live in the Midwest. There's snow and ice. You never know. <laughs> True that. That's I'm, I'm not, I don't necessarily think I would like drive myself into the water, but you never know. And Ted Kennedy's lady didn't think she was going to end up in the water either. Just also hi RP. Hello. And hi doll. And Hi, Sage, and hi, Orla. Oh my gosh, all the peoples. Um, BK Rowling was put on a high pedestal, which she was. The tumble would hurt if you're that high up. Yeah. I really liked her ever. I respect her for what she achieved professionally, but I don't like her as a person. I don't like her as an author. The world that she built, great, absolutely. But like, I'm a prose whore. Like I, I like I like my wordsmithing, and she is not a great wordsmith. I discovered Water and I are not friends. Ironically, in the military, drown proofing, which I had to be saved from drowning by another soldier. Yeah. Um, in the Navy, that's essentially how they teach you how to swim: is they drag you out of bed at three o'clock in the morning and throw you in. Mm -hmm. And yeah. three times they had to drag my sister out of the water because she she didn't know how to swim. So, yeah, that would not be. I actually that's the whole reason I learned how to swim is because my aunt is a sadist, so she would take me off the diving board against my will. So yeah, she probably wouldn't appreciate that I said that, but she won't watch my streams the whole time. <laughs> I think it's not like large bodies of water that spook me out. It's like lack of control of myself while I'm in the water. So for instance, uh, I went to the James River uh, a couple years back to like face my fears and stuff. So I'm sitting on the rocks and the current is trying to sweep me away. So I, I lost a couple of nails, like gripping onto the rocks, but like that did not help. And then I watched a little girl get swept away by the current and my boyfriend at the time do dove into the river and saved her. But like, I, I was like, I need a lifeguard. I am not, I am not comfortable with this, with this version of water. It is not, not my favorite. Yeah. I'm a pretty strong swimmer, so I don't have a fear specifically of water currents mm -hmm. do scare me though currents um, are scary but yeah. like like my husband is afraid of like a pool is scary to my husband in the same yeah, way any other it's scary to me yeah yeah and and i don't have that i enjoy water i like swimming but a current is like you no know, you don't I have any control have over that any higher than this yeah like there's something about my buoyancy that doesn't doesn't agree with water without salt if I can see the bottom of the water I'm engaging in, I'm fine. I know too much of the history and the myths of my town and swimming hole. I don't want to get that shit, that shit to get me. Yeah, that's cute. Yeah. Um, Raven said, what, what differentiates urban horror from urban fantasy? Are those even actual subgenres anymore? I can't keep up. I would say that urban horror is much more like the people under the stairs. Um, and urban fantasy has to have like some sort of fantastical element aside 
um, the people under the stairs, all of the like Hellboy. horror Hellboy. Uh, is human. Yeah. It's all human. Um, or what's the, the Snoop one? I can't think. Tales from the Hood. Um, where, <laughs> where like the, the horror is the urban, there's urban stuff. Yeah. That lives in the urban and, and like Candyman would probably be a hybrid yeah. because there's the urban horror. There's that horror of living in the projects and, and what that represents itself. And then there's the supernatural Candyman, that story. So, but that's like a hybrid. Yeah. Candyman's scary as hell. <laughs> I'd like to think the stories I'm trying to write are a crossbreed. But I'm not sure I really hedge the horror niche. Yeah, sometimes I struggle with it too. Um, there are times where I feel like I have to rely on gore a little bit, but. Fear, thrill versus awe and wonder. Scared of swimming as a kid, but don't remember why. Ironically, I'd learned to scuba dive when I was 16 and did it for three years. I'm kind of fascinated by the mystery of the deep ocean. I, one of the things about being a horror person is that I really enjoy being scared. So I'm not like against experiencing those things. Like the Meg is a thing I want to watch because it's going to scare the piss out of me. So. Interesting. I, I enjoy that. That's that's mm -hmm. why I write horror. So cool. So, um, one point five hours. We can also discuss our projects that are either coming up or our backlist. Um, I, for instance, have a supernatural thriller coming out in September on the 20th. Uh, people who are on my Patreon should be getting a copy of the book today. Oh. Patreon exclusive, y'all. Patreon exclusive. Two months or, yeah, month and a half early. That's, that's pretty damn early. So it's like beta, but I don't, I'm not expecting them to write a review. I'm just, right. I feel bad that I have been absent this past month here. <laughs> Here's a gift. Yeah. Sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do. Um, I have a novel that's like a haunted house story. Ooh. And then I have a short story collection and a couple short stories. That's all on Amazon under. It'll be in name. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Under that name. There you go. I'm, I'm the only Sarah Scheinweber. So that makes it pretty easy. That's why I did not change my name in writing when I got married because nice. Sarah Scharnweber is a lot less common. Um, so, yeah. There are plenty of movies that address agoraphobes. Gerald's Game is essentially agoraphobic on some level because it's um, someone being stuck to a bed. Um, oh, I not. I don't enjoy it. <laughs> That's, I've never made it through a journal. Usually it's done in thrillers and less, yeah. less horrors because the whole idea is that she needs to either protect herself in the house or she needs to leave the house for some reason or another. And the one place that she feels safe is being that those are the stakes, right? Is that mm -hmm. she, her safe space is no longer safe. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I've definitely seen agoraphobia used as part of a horror story. Um, but I don't think it's necessarily as functional as the basis, partly because agoraphobia is very specific. Mm -hmm. um, it's not something people experience in small doses for the most part. So like, you know, people are, people can be afraid of, something under the water specifically one time and, and have experienced that it's really hard to feel agoraphobia and not be agoraphobic. So I think that's part of the reason. something traumatic that happened in the open space. 
Right, but like mm -hmm. most humans don't experience don't experience a small bit of agoraphobia. It's not really a it's not really a, a regular experience, I guess. Um, hmm. So certainly was for me. <laughs> Sarah's books are in Amazon cart already. Aww. Once the book buying ban in the house has been lifted, it's going to be a buy now. <laughs> buy now. Well, thank you. I hope that you enjoy. I will also be purchasing them. them. Absolutely. I have I have a friend who um, developed agoraphobia and is working with a therapist to deal with it. But he still, like, he's been doing this for four or five years. And he still can't leave his house without, like, certain criteria being. So it's not a small feat to get over. Yeah. Um, and it, it doesn't, it's, it's very similar to like depression and things like that. Whereas um, you might solve the immediate issues with it, but the underlying problem is still there. Sure. Sure. So. Which is what makes like Ringu so like spoopy is that, um, the, the underlying problem is there was nothing that you could do to change the situation. Yeah. You just have to get, go into the situation and get it out. Yeah. And just get out of range of that thing that you cannot stop. Um, Junji Ito is one of my favorites. Absolutely. Um, but that's part of that is the, the art and less about like some of the concepts. Though uh, I am a creature that had nightmares as I was younger and then as I got older, they're not so much, the content didn't necessarily change, but I no longer feel terror in my dreams. Like that's it's not- I, I have night terrors so bad I'm on medication to that's used in combat nightmares. Yeah, I get I that. Gave my husband a black eye one time. Oh, yeah. That sucks. I feel like a bad, bad person. Next to someone when you have night terrors is risky. Yeah, yeah. Risky. That's. I, he doesn't get beat up very often, but every once in a while, like if your fight or flight is going and you can't see where it's going, <laughs> that's there's somebody next to you. Yeah, okay. exactly. And Junji Ito has basically like seen into my head and illustrated or animated some of my deep fears, some of my, yeah. some of my nightmares. Um, yeah. And that's, that's the other thing is that horror is so personal. Like what scares so you personal. might not scare the person next to you. Um, mm -hmm. And horror fans know what they want and know what they like and pick those things. So you have to keep in mind if you're going to write horror that there are going to be people who a cannot read it at all and b just don't get into what specific genre of horror you're writing in um so you you just have to be comfortable with that uh eva imagines that she could be treated for agoraphobia i think agoraphobia has become an a more relatable fear now that there's a pandemic like running around and i definitely know people who have ocd that has extended into an agoraphobia type thing in this current climate because they're afraid of the germs that they've always been afraid of but now they're they're solidified and real so leaving their house became scary so like it has kind of rolled into at least similar to agoraphobia, whether or not it actually falls under the actual umbrella, because that is a very specific thing. And that's another thing to keep in mind. If you're going to talk about phobias, phobias are different than fears. And yes, they are. you cannot use them interchangeably. It is incredibly offensive to somebody who actually experiences the phobia. Um, and it doesn't represent the fear. So make sure you're being careful with that. Right. Exactly. Like, can you function as a human being out in public? Then right. you probably don't have agoraphobia. Right, right. And, and you know, some people who fear are agoraphobic can't. Horror, but. 
Right. Some people who are agoraphobic can't step on their front porch, mm -hmm. you know? So, I mean, like, you have to keep in mind that that is not necessarily a social, like I have social anxiety. I can go out on my porch. I can walk around in my yard. Those things don't make me uncomfortable at all. Um, but if there was a group of people in my front yard, then it'd be different. So just be very careful when you're, when you're calling something a phobia or a fear that you're, you're being very or careful. You understand that. the difference between the two. Absolutely. All encompassing fear that might make the story's target audience prohibitively small. Um, that would, well, again, that would also address that which people don't necessarily understand. Mm -hmm. And the goal of the story would be to make them understand that particular. Yeah. That portion needs to be done in the character building. Um, yeah. In order to identify with the character and the way the character is behaving, you need to to make the reader understand what that phobia means to them and how it affects their ability to function and their day to day life and all those things. Oh my gosh! Doll also has night terrors. Got it penned into release next summer. Awesome, awesome. My son may have night terrors. He may also have just dream actively. He's not laughing, he's crying. Yeah. I apparently laugh in my sleep now that I'm on meds. Yeah, it, it really, um, kids tend to just be more animated when they're sleeping. That's not uncommon. Which is um, why like sleepwalking is more common when you're a kid. Yeah. You know, stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, and I think some of it might just be the fact that it's harder to tell what's real and what's not when you're a child anyway. Mm -hmm. So, and then, you know, we're all writers, so we all probably have a little bit of a problem with that. <laughs> probably. I commented on people relating to me early on. Just because I've lived it doesn't mean I don't feel all the same oogs that come along with it. Doll, I have I have noticed that Doll gets quite uncomfortable uh, when a chat gets too crowded. Yeah, yeah, and that I mean, there are a number of reasons that one could have that response. Like, just just the overwhelmingness of a chat moving fast can really like throw me off. Um, but I'm not afraid of the chat itself. So there, just keep in mind that just because something can come from a phobia or a fear doesn't necessarily mean that's where it's coming from. And being overwhelmed can behave like a fear, um, partly because it's usually run by your anxiety. Correct. Started with social anxiety and then became habit. Yeah. Uh, not agoraphobic, but it wasn't exactly in a rush to leave my house. And my pattern of activity hasn't really changed all that much. Yeah. Yeah, I prefer to be comfortable and I'm more comfortable in my home. Like, without fail, every time I am more comfortable here than I am elsewhere. <laughs> so, hmm. see, I have the same thing, Sage, where it's, it's social anxiety, it's not a phobia. It's, and it's a, it's a thin line mm -hmm. between discomfort and anxiety inducing and then there's terror. Yeah. Right. Like there's, there is a distinct difference between the two. So Natalie has a fear of a phobia of loud noises, especially banging. So living in a village with fewer than 300 people is healing. Yeah. Well, or just and, enforcing the fear, right? Yeah, yeah, and like for for one person it might be, you know, this thing, and for another person it might be another thing. I know people who are not afraid of all loud noises, but are afraid of a balloon popping, um, specifically. Like these things are so incredibly personal, um, and that's important to know when you're fleshing out a character. 
that you can have two characters who are afraid of the same thing from a different place. And, and that's okay. And it also will help you to identify how those characters are different and how those things coming from a different place is different. Um, someone who using like doll in the chat versus me in the chat, um, someone who is afraid of the, who, who has like a phobia of the too many people and it feeling too large is going to respond different in the same response world as someone who is uncomfortable because of the social. I, yeah, I go into battle mode when I'm in a crowd. Yeah. And it, it just depends on the person. It depends on, on where that fear stems from and those things. So, um, so the trope of like the kid who has their third eye open essentially. Thank you, mama. I have, I got gifted some cake. <laughs> I guess I'm having cake for, for lunch. Um, so there is a horror trope of the kid who can see ghosts, who can see mm -hmm. in the future, who have that special friend right? Yep, absolutely. Um, and I also found, I worked in a group home for a long time. I found that people also tend to believe that developmentally disabled persons have that, um, tend to have that as well. And I think that is, that comes from the, the stifling that happens earlier so that they, because they function on the same wavelength as a child, a lot of times that that can stem into it. So that's another thing that, that you can use there. Um, yeah. And, you know, if you're going to use something like a developmental disability or something like that, though, you really need to know what you're doing because uh, that, that can go real offensive real fast. <laughs> social anxiety. Oh, no bad, a large chat because social anxiety. Yeah. Yep. I, I definitely have sat and watched <laughs> streams and not commented because I was like, there's too many damn people in here. Negative. So I guess I'll find out later. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, is that it's, it's a, we're in a strange, strange place right now. Mm -hmm. so. I'm okay in a crowd as long as I'm not the center of attention in said crowd. Oh, interesting. So like a concert doesn't bother me. Mm. Um, but if I was on the stage, it would. <laughs> right. Because there's like performance anxiety, right? Right. Right. Definitely have anxiety working as a receptionist in a nursing home. Um, I totally understand that. But that's, as, an, that's an anxiety for sure. Yeah. yeah. As someone who worked as a social worker in a nursing home, I just want to tell you, I'm sorry, I didn't answer my call. I just didn't want to talk to them. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's been five years now, so I don't feel that guilty, but I've definitely done that. <laughs> also the trope of old people regaining that sight when they near death. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a thing. Absolutely. Or they lose, they like they're so overtaken by dementia that they talk about seeing such things. Why do you want to hear me sing, Devin? Is that what's happening? I don't know. Devin said I want to hear Sarah sing. Uh, weird. No, you don't. Negative. <laughs> August, August 6th, karaoke. Yeah, no, you don't want anything to do with that. <laughs> so this oh, is totally spooking Natalie out. So we need to write all the banging stories. Uh, he defends his fellow street folk from predator natural threats because, well, they're easy targets otherwise. He. That's a continuation of a previous comment. Yeah. Of their previous I, I've asked it before in other venues, but never to a large group of fellow writers. One of my main protagonists is a homeless person. 
He defends the street folk from preternatural threats because, well, they're easy targets otherwise. Okay. I mean, you can definitely work with that. You just have to be very careful not to, um, like, satirize um, homelessness. Um, like, Judgment Night. And it was like a late 90s movie where these dudes are going to a concert or something and they end up in like the hood um, and their car breaks down and they happen to see like a dude get murdered in a drug deal and it it becomes like this whole other thing. But like um, they use a lot of a lot of things like drug addiction and homelessness and and like what causes this neighborhood to be the way it is. Um, but you have to be really respectful of those things when you're expressing that. So you might want to talk to people who've been homeless, mm -hmm. talk to people who live in areas where homelessness is prevalent, talk to people who work in like shelters, things like that, because there are experiences and things that you might not think of. For instance, Absolutely. one of the most unsafe places to be in my city is at the homeless shelter. Yeah. People are raped and assaulted in the homeless shelter and no one does anything. That's mm -hmm. not a thing most people know. If you have, if you are a single mother with children, don't go in the homeless shelter. Do not go. Don't. It's, it is the most dangerous place you can take the children. If you're going to write about homelessness as your focal point, I strongly recommend, like Eva says, sensitivity readers. Just to make sure yeah. you're not. Yeah, um, but you can. Those. You can make your sensitivity reading shorter and much more productive if you spend the time ahead of time learning about those communities before you write. Um that it's, it's important to not lean too heavily on your sensitivity readers. Like you should know, you should know these things. Um, your sensitivity readers should help you with the things that you can't know, but you should definitely do the research. People talking about being in the theater, the difference between being a focal point, like, like saying at a book launch party and being the, the center of attention, right? Yeah. As opposed to being on stage and, and performing an art, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, sharing a skill with people. Yeah. I've only done book events where there were other authors there mm -hmm. and that has been okay for me. Um, but I think if I was the only author there, I'd feel different about it. Biggest concern was making light of being homeless or making it seem like it's not a big deal. I don't want to glamorize homelessness by making a homeless person a superhero. I have made gods out of homeless people. Nancy Collins made a homeless person an angel, a seraphim. And what that meant to someone like a vampire, like, it's... There's like an underlying enlightenment that some people can't can't relate unless they go through it, right? Yeah. Yeah, and that's another one that because you know that your readers will not all have experienced it, you're going to have to make your reader experience it. Right. So keep that in mind. If it's not a typical human experience, you have to make them experience it whether or not they do. Showing, not telling. Mm -hmm. You have to, you have to make them feel these things. You have to make them know what it's like to sleep, not knowing if they're going to wake up with all their shit gone or if they're going to wake up at all. If they're going to wake up at all. Yeah. Those kinds of things. Um, you should definitely ask about troubles. For instance, I live in a city where we have parking garages with heated, Elevators, they turn the heat off in all the elevators when it gets cold so that the homeless people won't sleep in there. Yeah, it's that that's a problem in DC too. Mm -hmm. So yeah. instead they crowd the sewers. Yeah, well, we don't we don't have that uh, access here, but 
it's a uh, it's pretty terrible. It's to keep all the normies comfortable. It bugs the piss out of me. Well, there's yeah, people sleeping in the subway. That's true. Yeah. In the metro. Yeah, for sure. Separation of self. Um. So having that persona, well, as mm -hmm. like Sage mentions, having that persona yeah. on stage kind of separates you from that thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that works for some people. That works for some people. And some people don't mind just like being on stage. <laughs> Oh my God, did I find the end of it? Simon R. Green made an entire alleyway of dispo dispossessed homeless gods. I know it can be done. I'm just trying to make sense of the character I'm creating. Sure. Budapest had homeless people camping in the subway stations. Yep. I remember people telling me not to go there at night. And never gave a damn about it. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the thing. Humans, humans are very nervous about things they don't understand, and homelessness is a thing that um, people don't tend to want to understand. I think because it's uncomfortable. So. Absolutely. That in and of itself is a persona, you know? I definitely know people who don't function outside of their persona. Like, I know a couple of people who I'm one of five or six people who's ever seen the real them. Because every moment of their life is a persona. Um, they tend to be on all the time. Right. That just sounds incredibly tiring to me. It is. It is. <laughs> it's exhausting. I'll, right. I'll just be an asshole all the time and we'll all be fine with it. <laughs> Performance anxiety is a thing. Yeah, for, for real. real. Absolutely. I've considered doing like um, story readings on my channel partly to deal with that issue because at some point, when things are normal again, I may want to go do a book reading somewhere. But if I did that today, I would just die. Uh -huh. I'd just die with my book on my head. Yep. Also, Doll is an awesome singer. I have to agree. I would guess because of... Uh, being partially blind, right? That not seeing your your audience could be either helping or hindering, depending on how you know you are perceiving. Right, how your brain decides to process it. How you're able to process it. Yeah. Hi, Alexis. How's it going? We were we were talking about the things now we're getting now we're wrapping up for real this time <laughs> good morning ADHD writer this is what happened last time you said we were gonna wrap and then people showed up and then people showed up and then I was like let's let's chat some more about horror and fear I and, mean, and I'm fine with that screw it up how to not screw up horror it basically is how it yeah goes. yeah but I do have another stream so yes absolutely do have to do that eventually. Thank you all for joining us. Absolutely. Sarah, if you would like to do your outro. Okay. Um, I am Sarah Schoenover. I tend to write horror. If it's not horror, it's dark. Um, I have a stream this afternoon, I think at noon. I don't freaking know. I can't keep track of things. At twitch.tv slash Plastic Age Plays, where we're playing Scarblands, which is like an offshoot of D&D, because um, it's Gen Con weekend. So... I'll be over there, and at some point today I'll put out a video, and then at some point in the near future I'll put out another video. That's a whole long story. 
Uh, and I got books over on Amazon. So that's all of it. Cool. And I'm Sako Toomey, also known as Cass Boyd. I am releasing a supernatural thriller on September 20th. It will only be available on Storytellers Vault. Links will be provided, etc., etc. And we will catch you guys on the flip side. <laughs>